Jeremiah chapter 10. Can you go there this morning? Uh, don't you love when pastors ask the question, can you, would you? I'm waiting for somebody to go, no. Uh, so, but uh, go there this morning. Jeremiah chapter 10. I have been diving into the book of Jeremiah. I have uh, been intrigued with Jeremiah 1 through 9. And then I get to Jeremiah chapter 10. And, uh, and this has kind of been in the hopper for several, several weeks now. One of the best pieces of advice I was given when I started pastoring 16 years ago was, hey, get your sermons about four and five weeks out, because if you don't, um, a couple of things. One, uh, you are going to be at the mercy of everything you hear, like everything you experience as a pastor. Uh, if you don't have it all planned out, uh, you will be nothing but a reactionary pastor behind the pulpit. And uh, great piece of advice. And so that is what I've done all 16 years is just say, okay, God, what do you want? I already know what's on the hopper for next Sunday morning, next Sunday night. Um, and uh, this Sunday night uh, was a message I was supposed to preach three Sunday nights from right now. And the Lord kind of moved it up. Uh, so uh, I am excited. I love the journey because I am not a slave to what has gone on in your world this week. I am not a slave to what's gone on in my world this week. But I am amazed at how God lines it up with what I need. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 and uh, let's unpack a little bit of God today, if you don't mind. We're going to go a little bit deep. Uh, we're going to get into the Word, so keep your Bibles handy. I hate to do this to you, but you need your Bible today. Uh, you just can't stare at me, and uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your Word is so insightful, and your Word has become a source of strength and a source of comfort for myself. And Lord, I pray on this Sunday morning, it is no accident that we are here. It is no accident. This is the text for the day uh, and God, just please watch over us, help us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that w- walketh to direct his steps. That verse does not mean what you think it means, because in context of the chapter and of the book, Jeremiah 10, 24. O oh Lord, would you look at this next word, correct me but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. I'm going to preach this morning on this subject, correct me, but be fair. Correct me, but be fair. There are many people that will be listening to this sermon, that they'll say, Pastor, that was kind of an odd sermon for a Sunday morning. But I'll tell you, it's a necessary sermon for Christianity. Because when you take God and you start looking at God and you look at him through the lens of God's word, Jeremiah is a reluctant prophet chosen by God. His task was to warn the people of Judah, and please don't forget this, about the impending doom of That if they continue to stray from God's commandment and continue to be engaged in idolatry and injustice, God would have to send and God would have to do some correcting. Despite facing resistance and persecution, Jeremiah faithfully delivers his message, often using vivid uh, uh, imagery and metaphors to convey God's wrath and the consequences of disobedience. Throughout the book, Jeremiah goes into anguish and somewhat a little bit of depression because of what the people are doing. He starts wrestling with his call, feeling both the burden of delivering difficult truths to people he loves, but yet keeping them understanding that God will not deal with us like he's going to deal with the heathen. The book of Jeremiah is a timeless reminder of these three things. The consequence of disobedience, the importance of repentance, and God's enduring faithfulness even when we are being corrected. I'm going to challenge each of you this morning, and I'm going to be very deliberate in my words. I'm going to challenge each of you this morning to go into the elevator of your heart, and I want you to go down into the chambers of who you are. And I want you to walk through your imagery and walk through your life and ask yourself this question. Am I living a life of a condition 
that I am being hypocritical in who I am? And do I need to be corrected? Is there something in my life that the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me for months, for years, for weeks, that I right now am like, I just, I, I think you'll be okay. Please know this about God, that God is long-suffering, but God has to correct you to get you back to a relationship with him. There's a lot of times, oh, love, God's love. God will overlook, and this is true. But you know what God wants more than overlooking what we do? He wants a relationship with you and I. At the very beginning of the book of Jeremiah, guess what he said? He said, I remember you when you were innocent, when you were kind, and our relationship. God knows this. The scene is always the same at the gray house when we were growing up. Warning upon warning upon warning. A couple of things I never understood. I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. I never really understood that. Does that mean you get a ruler out and you're like, okay, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, now I can stop because I've come within an inch of your life. I, I, I never understood when a parent said, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I've wanted to turn around many times and go, liar, you're lying through your teeth. But the scene was always the same in the gray household. Son, stop that. Excuse me. Kimberly, stop that. Karen, stop that. Scott, stop that. Mom, you better listen to your dad. Son. And my dad would be in that recliner when he was home. And invariably, when we were just little people, and we were running around that house, and they were trying to correct with their words, and, and we would overlook it, and we would not stop it. But as soon as my father reached on the side of that, how many know what I'm talking about, the side of that recliner, and you heard the click, right? And you could tell how mad he was by how, how loud the thump was, right? So you heard the click, and the foot of that recliner would come down, and my dad would get out. His philosophy with this, if I've got to move to get out of this chair, it's too late. I am coming to correct you. And it wouldn't matter, Dad, I'm sorry. Dad, I'll never do it again. Pl dad, please, I promise you, if you will just give me another chance. Let me tell you something. Up to that point, he had given us 100 chances. Can I tell you that I need to come to you, and I need to let you know that don't put it past a loving God to reach down and click. And I don't know why I'm preaching this. I don't know who I'm preaching this to. But Jeremiah was pleading with the people of God to stop letting the heathen be their teachers. Look at Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 2. Let's just put it all in context. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 2, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. Basically it was this, do not learn the way of the heathen to where now you look at life and go, oh, I don't know why that's happening. Don't, don't, no, 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 don't be that simple minded. Don't, don't think you can live today, party tonight, and wake up tomorrow morning and be where you need to be to go to work. Don't, don't be looking this way and go, well, I don't know why I'm tired. You know why you're tired? You stayed up till 5 in the morning. He said, stop learning the way of the heathen. Then he takes, and this is the text everybody loves against Christmas trees. How did Christmas make it in May? Here's how it made it. Look at verse number 3. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And there are people who go, see, 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 pastor? Right there, we shouldn't have Christmas trees. And if you don't believe in Christmas trees, God bless you. And if you're looking for a verse, there's a verse you can use it, but you're going to use it out of context. Someone said the other day, do you worship the tree? I'm going to ask like my dad did. Nope, but I worship the things under the tree. <laughs> and uh, don't look at me that way. I'm still 56, but I still shake boxes and sniff and, and like this. And I still do. Come on, Brother Johnson. I still do those kind of things. And Brother Chris, you probably do the same thing. It's like, I got to find out what's in here. And always remember, the, but look at the next one. What they were doing was, is what this means, what they would take a tree and they would manipulate this tree to look like a person. Okay? This is what they would do. They, they, they would give it man features. Because look at the next verse. 
Bible always explains itself. They are upright as palm trees, but what? Speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. You know what he was saying? Stop turning a tree into an idol of a god. Stop learning. So they didn't take a tree. It wasn't putting decorations on the tree. They actually would manipulate the tree to stand upright like a palm tree. And then they would give it hands and give it features like a gold man. And they would sew gold plate. They, it was like a paper mache. And then they would say, these are our gods. You know what Jeremiah was saying? They ain't got hands and they ain't got a mouth. And they can't even carry themselves. They can't even walk. Christmas tree. There you go. You can say, I went to, what did you learn at church today? We don't. We're okay with our Christmas tree. If you're not, I'm okay. However, the people of God had proven that they were not about to listen to God and that God had sent them warning after warning after warning and they would not and could not stop it. Therefore, the entire book of Jeremiah is about this. You're going into captivity because of who you are. And this is why you get to verse number 23. Look at it. Oh, Lord, I know that the way a man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah is telling them that they don't get to pick the timing of the correction. What Jeremiah was telling them is this. You don't get to pick the timing, and you can't stop the correction. You see, when dad was in the chair, I didn't get to pick when he had enough. He knew. He knew. And it was not common, uncommon for him to just to do this. You know what he was doing? I'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself. But once he clicked it, once the chair came down, I didn't get to pick the timing. I didn't get to pick the venue. And what God is telling Jeremiah is he is telling Jeremiah this. Jeremiah, or what Jeremiah is saying here is this. I know, oh Lord, I know that this nation of Israel, that it's not even in them to pick the timing or when this is going to happen. But it's going to happen. And Jeremiah is telling God, God, when you correct, and this is verse 24. When you correct, would you please do it with judgment? There are some of you that have children that are living the opposite of the way they were raised. Some of you have family members that have abandoned God, the house of God, and they're out in the world. I would tell you, one, do not ever criticize them publicly or privately to the people around you. Number two, love them. Do not ostracize them. This is not even in keeping with who God is. But pray that when God corrects them, be fair. There are some of you right now listening to me that you look good on the outside. But on the inside, you're away from the Lord. And the Lord has already told you, you better stop it. Or I am going to have to come out of the recliner. I'm going to have to correct you. you. Say, Pastor, are you preaching to anybody? I don't even know what's going on in this auditorium. Because this was done weeks ago. But I can tell you this. Whatever is going on, God wants this church to hear this morning. That whatever is going on, correct it. But know this. If and when God has to correct us. He will be fair with us. Jeremiah 10, 24. There are two biblical ways of correction. One is God correcting. Look at Jeremiah 2, 19. I find this very interesting, the placement of this in the book of Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, if you go back, and, 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 and I'm going to go a little bit deep tonight, to th this morning. If you go back in Jeremiah, and you do this chronologically, contextually, look what it says. It says this, Jeremiah 2, 19, thine own wickedness shall, what please, correct thee. Did you see that there? Thine own wickedness shall, what, correct thee. Start thinking in terms of God when it comes to I need this situation corrected. You know how God does it? First of all, God is like the father that he stands back at the house and he lets the prodigal leave the house and he lets the prodigal, he lets the wickedness 
and the journey down to the hog pen, he lets the journey down to the hog pen do its work to where he comes to himself and he says, what am I doing here? You see, God uses first the way to correct. Would you go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15? And if you have a thumb tab Bible, you're a cheater. Okay, and if you have a tablet right now, you're not even playing fair. Amen? I found this to be true. Most people use tablets because they have, they're blind. <laughs> they, and, uh, so look at Proverbs 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth honor. Would you look at this next one? But the way, Proverbs 13, 15. Don't you love it when the pastor says, turn to this, and it's such a short verse. Jesus wept. Okay, now go to, look at it says, but the way of transgressors is what? hard. You know what God does? And you say, well, God hadn't corrected me yet. God hadn't done this to anything to me yet. I've been living this way for years. Let me tell you something. Always remember this. God's letting the way to see what kind of job it does on you. And if people can't recognize I'm losing money because of how I'm living, I'm losing family because of how I'm living, I'm losing finances, I'm losing health, I'm losing this. Let me tell you something, God allows the way to correct us, he allows the transgressions to correct us, he allows the empty nights of drunkenness to correct us, he allows the next morning of something to correct us, he allows the guilt to correct us, he allows the bad feelings to correct us, but when we get ourselves into the habitual over and over and over again, let me tell you something, God says now. Now I've got to come out of the recliner, and now I will correct you. And what Jeremiah says to God is he says, God, please correct us, but don't do it. Go back, go back to Jeremiah. Correct us. Oh, Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Israel had been dishonoring the Lord. They had been in their heart and in their actions not taking heed to the messengers or the messages. And because they were not listening to the messenger and they were not listening to the message, and let me preface this and say, I am not talking about me. I'm talking about all those voices in a person's life that while they're on their way and doing what they know is not the action, it is the lifestyle now that they're living. God doesn't, the, the actions are your human. God remembers that we are dust. It is when we take these actions and now it becomes our identity and it's how we live and it's how we walk. It becomes our swagger. It becomes our fragrance. It becomes who we are. Let me tell you something. When that becomes who you are, God's going to turn you loose and God's going to let the way correct us but when we are not taking heed to the bumpy road without God God goes okay now let me step in 70 years of captivity 70 years this is how God would correct his people 70 years the way of a transgressor's heart. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. But when you don't take heed to that, then God says, let me come out of the recliner. Now let me start correcting. We look at correction differently than how God looks at correction. So let's look at three spiritual truths about this. The first spiritual truth I want to give you this morning that please know this. In verse 24, O Lord, correct me, but with what, please? Judgment, not in thine, what? Anger. Most of the corrections you and I have received in our life, some of the correction, let me back up, maybe a small percentage of the correction has been done sometimes out of anger. We have seen when we have irritated an authority. We have seen when all of a sudden, be it a parent or, or some spiritual leader or a boss or, or somebody, that we have seen them turn on their heels and with anger take care of something. When I worked for Chuck Brush and, and, and doing roofs, I remember when I was 19 and a half, Brother Zinn and I were on the roof and we would work for Chuck Brush and, and he would say, double tap that nail. 
And I was like, excuse me, sir? He said, hit it flush, then hit it again so it countersinks it underneath the surface. Hitting it once is correct. Making sure you prove a point, that is anger. And what Jeremiah was saying to God was, God, when you correct us, do not correct us by proving a point. Just correct us with justice. Correct us with the facts. Don't correct us based on feeling. Because listen, when God goes to correct, stop sheltering wayward people in your prayers with God not correcting them. Do not play God in somebody's life. The quickest way to get back to a relation is that God deal with them. Those are hard words for me to tell you. I do not come to you today being your friend. I come to you telling you there is a God in heaven. Let God do God's job. We would never think about stepping in to a parent with a child unless we were for sure that that parent was abusing that child and whooping up on that child to the point. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. You don't have to worry about that with your God. If you have a child right now that is away from the Lord, if you have a spouse right now that's away from the Lord, or if you have, if you are away from the Lord, know this. When you come to God and when God starts correcting, he does not correct with anger. He does not satisfy his anger in his correction. Go to Exodus 32, 9, because the Bible gives us insight. Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 9. And I'm going to unpack God. Are you all okay with that today? I'm going to unpack God because I think there is such a wonderful thing in correction. That sounded odd, didn't it? There is such a wonderful thing in correction. And correction has to be turned over to the ultimate corrector. Look at Exodus 32, 9. Because you need to know the potential. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a what? Stiff-necked. Keep looking. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may what? Consume them them you know what God did God got to the point with this children of Israel that he said get out of my way my anger has waxed hot I am going to consume them look at verse number seven back up to verse seven here's why he said that he does not operate just to get somebody look why he said that look at verse seven and the Lord said unto Moses go get thee down for thy people which thou brought us up out of the lands of Egypt have what please corrupted themselves you see God in his nature and God in who he is has sent his son to die on the cross and this is the salvation that you and I have and by the way if you don't have salvation if you're here today and you are not saved hold on to the very end because God will not deal with you if you're not saved God will not deal with you the way I'm saying he deals with his children but God deals with us in correction through judgment justice he does not mount up with anger when he corrects go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 God's correction does not provoke his children to become worse but prevents them from becoming worse God's correction when God goes to correct And I will tell you, I would take this sermon and I would listen to it time and time again. Here's why. You need to have the God mindset when you pray for people that are anti-God in your world. And people that are anti-God in your world, God looks at them as a Jeremiah chapter 2. I remember when you were pure. I remember when you were kind. I remember when you had a relationship with me, but you have learned the way of the heathen and now you are corrupt. God's going to have to deal And when God deals, he does not deal with his feelings. He walks through justice to deal. I think we've given up on a lot of situations rather than ask God to take care of situations. Can I say that again? We have given up on situations rather than ask God to take care of situations. You've been there, I've been there. You're on a date with your Sweetheart, you're in a restaurant, you're trying to enjoy a romantic evening, and, and uh, you look up and the 
the, the, the hostess comes to the table next to you and puts out ten menus and then she puts out six baby seats. <laughs> now there's only four big people chairs and there's six little people chairs. How many know where I'm going? You're, you're trying to enjoy peace and quiet and holding your sweetheart's hand and staring into her eyes and saying, did you pay the water bill? No. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then all of a sudden, you're like, these must be four phenomenal parents, two families. Then they wheelchair one of them, and then they walk her another one. Now it's two old people. Now it's like four on two. And then the two parents come, and then the kids are throwing stuff, and they're na 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 whatever. Are you wanting the children to be corrected because you don't like the children? No, I'm just trying to enjoy a time with my wife. Can I tell you that when God looks to correct, and he sees his children out of, out of control, he does not take his hands off the situation. But we take our hands off the situation through prayer. And you know what we've done to a lot of situations of people that are out of control? We don't pray. God, you are their father. You are their parent. I'm going to ask you to correct them. We live in such a liberal society to where we think a whipping is abuse. Let me tell you something. A good old-fashioned woodshed. You speak in terms like this, people, oh, let's, let's clip that one to Pastor Gray and let you, a good old, which camera am I on? A good old-fashioned woodshed helped me a lot. I am not 450 swats at our house. We only gave five. That's it. And very rarely did I give five. Normally it was three. And very rarely with those three did I ever have to get cranked up. They were deliberate, they were on purpose, and I never, never slapped anybody across the face. Never. That kind of junk. No, 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 no. And here's what we've done. We've taken our liberal parenting. Some of y'all are a little bit upset right now, aren't you? We've taken that, li that liberal parenting. Guess what we've done? We've asked God to be a liberal parent with his children and we have not looked at the parents at the next table and gone, Sir, I don't know you, but your children are making it awful in this restaurant. You have four children. Correct them. Take the spaghetti bowl away. Take the knife away. Take the butter he has smeared everywhere away. Juan's going, why are you looking at me? I ain't got no kids. <laughs> and, uh, and do you know what we've done? we like, well, I just don't know why God's not working in their life. Have you prayed for God to correct their life? But his correction is done not in anger. His correction is done with his justice. Because look at what he'll never do to his children. Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers, he's our father, provoke not your children to what, please? wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and what? Admonition of the Lord. You can write out beside that, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Because when God corrects, he does not provoke. When God corrects, there is all of a sudden this realization by the child, I deserve that. Do you know the best weapons you ever got? And the best correction you ever got is when you knew you deserved it. The worst correction whippings you ever got was when, what did I do? I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. God will take care of his children. And before they ever were your children, they were God's children. And before you ever stopped being your parents' ch child, and now well, my parents can't tell me what to do. Oh, you got a heavenly father in heaven that he is your heavenly father. And guess what? He's going to correct. Is this too heavy for a Sunday morning? Because I'm going to tell you right now, there are people living a free life thinking they can do anything they want to do and God's not going to. Oh, please listen to this. Once a person becomes rebellious and stiff-necked and stiff heart toward the things of God, 
because you are his child. But when he corrects, he will not provoke. Go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. And this is always a dichotomy. This is like two bookends here, right? Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, to anger. Excuse me. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be, what is that word? Lest they be what? Discouraged. Somebody expl- explain this to me. Explain this to me. Explain this to me. Are you ready? Are you ready? Explain it to me. How can one set of parents be disciplinarians and correct? And they got happy kids. Right? They got happy kids. And then another set of parents discipline and correct, and their kids are always mad. Here's why. Because if you correct out of anger, and you correct out of provoking and proving a point, your kids with the absence of love will all of a sudden not take it one day. They're not going to take it one day. Keep screaming at me. Keep hollering at me. You never tell, you, tell me you love me. I'll tell you right now. That is not how God corrects. God, when he corrects, he doesn't prove a point. And when God corrects, he doesn't leave discouraged children. He leaves happy children. Okay, that first spiritual truth was so wonderful. Go to Jeremiah 10, 25. So please know this, the very first spiritual truth, and don't check out on that one because you're going to need the last one to complete everything. The first spiritual truth is this, God does correct. But when God does correct, he corrects with judgment. He does not correct out of feelings. Because God proved to us that he had the opportunity to wipe everybody out, but he didn't wipe everybody out. He simply corrected in judgment. And he told the children of Israel, you are so corrupt and you're so stiff-necked that I'm going to send you to captivity. Call that time out. Call that ground. I don't care what the discipline mode is. Listen very closely. God was done with his people. And God said, and Jeremiah even said, oh, Lord, it's not even in them to direct. They, they're wanting to pick the timing and the conditions. God, I know that's not even going to be possible. Look at Jeremiah 10, 25. The second spiritual truth I want to give you is God corrects differently with his children. Can I say this? It's better for you to fall into the hands of a God, of a God who Jesus is your Savior, than to fall into the hands of a God that Jesus is not your Savior. All things being said, you better thank God you're saved. <laughs> you better look at it. Jeremiah 10 25, this is what he said Pour out thy fury upon the heathen. God, if you're going to be ticked at somebody, be it ticked at them people that are heathens. Look at what he's saying. And, 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 And that know thee not. And upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. The nature of God, listen to this, does not change with salvation. His love with salvation, when he goes to correct brings out his love, not his anger. But people who are not saved, if you're sitting here this morning and you are not saved, or you even think to yourself, I'm I'm still struggling with it, let me beg you, get it settled today. At the invitation time, you come down, let's get it settled. Don't play with that kind of stuff. Because if you are not saved, then all the wrath and all the anger that has been stored up in God Would you please travel with me to some verses? Let's go. John chapter 3, verse 36. We'll go in order so you don't have to go back. Let's start in John chapter 3, verse 36. And this is why God's given us the opportunity to get the gospel out. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. This is what the book says. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. What's the last phrase say? But the wrath of God abideth what? On him. You can't get past it. 
If you are not saved today, God is hoping that you trust him. And if you're battling with your salvation, don't play those kind of games because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. The Lord may come back this afternoon and you know this. God's got this wine press. He's got this bat. He's got this cup we're getting ready to look at. And it is stored up with wrath. This is why he turned his back on his son. This is why his son went through darkness. Because he's got this wrath stored up that he is going to destroy it all. But he's not trying to destroy you. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I didn't say it. Look at the book. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You're like, Pastor, it is Sunday morning and you still got a good 25 minutes to go. We're in trouble. Look at it. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what, please? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who hold the truth and unrighteousness. God's got the wrath. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 6. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of what? Disobedience. That is not action, that is a condition. Please know that. It is not action, it is a condition. The reason they're called children of disobedience is because they've not obeyed the gospel and accepted Christ. How many are saved? Raise your hand. Oh, you better be glad. You better be glad. Because the wrath of God is not stored up against those of you that are saved. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. And please don't check out because of some things I've said that you disagree with, but check in. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of what? Disobedience. Go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. You say, Pastor, I just got the Colossians. Go to the end of the book. We'll stay in two chapters, 14 and 15. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You, if you are not saved, you are going to experience by association. Listen, if you're struggling with your salvation, let's get it settled today. But if you are not saved, you are going to experience the wrath of God by association. Because when he goes to get them, the Bible tells us that he will absolutely, the wine of the wrath of God poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and this wrath will torment with fire and brimstone, and this, but you are not made for that. Look at verse number 19. And the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great, what, wine press of the wrath of God. Look at chapter 15, verse number 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the, what, wrath of God. Can I say this? God is premeditating. God is premeditating. He already has a plan to pour his wrath out. And if you're not saved this morning, I think I'd come down an old-fashioned altar. You can even come right now. And let's get this thing settled. If you're not saved, please don't take one more step. Let's get it settled right now. Anybody like that this morning? You say, Pastor, I'm not playing any more games. I just need to get this settled. Don't, don't, you've heard it. Let me tell you something. I'm telling you right now, his wrath is stored up against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. And if you don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ as you're covering, you are in that spot. It's, it's not going to be good. It's going to be bad. But know this, because we're saved, when God goes to correct, he does not correct us with his wrath. He corrects us with a plan. 
just like he's premeditated his wrath on those who are not saved, he has premeditated his plan for correction. Most parents, if when I ask them, when they come and say, Pastor, can you help us with the correcting of our children? I'll ask them, what's your goal? And you know what they'll tell me sometimes? Well, well, my, my goal is for them to obey. Okay, then that's temporary. What's your goal? Well, well, my goal is for them to leave me alone. Okay, that's temporary. Nothing wrong with those facts. But that's not, that shouldn't be your goal. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 29. And I promise you, I'll only make you go one more place in the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter 29. So God is telling them, you're going to exile. You're going to captivity. I have to correct you. And the whole purpose of this morning is this. God will correct. Let's not make God some old grandpa up, upstairs that he's just been through time and he's father time. He's not father time and there is no mother nature. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Mother nature didn't bring those tornadoes. God's in heaven going, Okay, I just got back from there. All right, Jeremiah chapter 29. Look at verse number 10. For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years. So my question is this to parents. After the correction is what? What are you wanting? And if you want a God way to look at correction, look at it. For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, the thoughts of what, please? The thoughts of what? Peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. For whom, sorry, that's the next verse I'm not going to. To give you an expected end. What was his expected end? He told me he's going to return to what place? Right? To the place. Go to Jeremiah, if you will. Are you in Jeremiah? Back up to chapter 2. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. What place? What is the correction of God trying to bring somebody back to? Look at it. Jeremiah chapter 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I... What? Remember thee, what? The kindness of thy youth, the love of thy espousal, when thou wentest after me in the what? Wilderness, in the land that was not sown. You know what he was saying? There was a time that we didn't care how much we had. We had each other. What is the end of God's correction? You know what the end of God's correction is? Let's get back to the table and play more games. My parents, when they parented us until we were teenagers and we started going our own way as far as schedules and things of that nature, when we were just little people, that's why my mom always referred to us as little people, it was not uncommon for us to sit around the table and play games. We would play games. And, and, and we would play games. And invariably, one of the other siblings would get an attitude. They were terrible at games. I always kept the rules. I always tried to do what's right. <clears throat> but Karen could not stand cheaters. Karen was like, no, no, you can't do that. And, and I would cheat on purpose to be an instrument of God to help her Christianity. <laughs> and Karen, that's, well... Then we would get into these attitudes. You know how kids are. And then all of a sudden, it's not about the game. Now it's our attitude. Now we're corrupt, right? My mom would go, come here. She'd take us by the hand. Y'all been there. She would leave the table. She would go to the back room, correct us. For what reason? So that we could get back to the table and enjoy the family. You see, what we want with correction is not denial, uh, annihilation. We don't want devastation. When God corrects us, it's with the end and the purpose of getting us back to the place when it was kindness and love, and it was about us and not what we had and not what we could give and not my rights. It's just us. 
And I will tell you that if right now there are people in your world that are not experiencing God, they don't care about God, then start praying, God, would you correct them so that we can get back to where we need to be? And God will always correct them, and listen to this very closely, in the prison of the error of their ways, so that when they left a servant, they now can come back a son. Sound familiar? Go to Philemon, and that's where we'll end. When God corrects, he does not correct for the purpose of anathema. When God corrects his children, and please know this, if you're estranged from God right now, if you are not where you need to be in your heart right now with the Lord Jesus Christ, you know it. The Lord knows it. And get ready, he's going to have to correct you. We may never know it. I mean, I mean, how many of us are not aware of, nobody comes to church and says, hey, guess what I did Friday night? I lined up all of our kids and we whipped them. I mean, nobody ever talks about that. All right? Hey, guess what happened? The other day, uh, nobody ever talks about that kind of stuff. But I will tell you this, when God goes to correct, God will isolate, God will isolate for the purpose of fixing and then return for the purpose of family. Philemon, look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, which I have begotten in my bonds. Paul's preaching from prison. Which in times past was to thee what, please? Times past was what? Yeah. Onesimus. Do you have an Onesimus in your world? Unprofitable. Look what it says here. Whom I have sinned again, verse 12, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, but in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Look at verse number 14, but without my mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly, for perhaps, and this is the verse, these two verses I claim, for perhaps, he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him, what please? Forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. A brother, what please? Beloved. Do you know what God's correction is all about? It's not about proving a point in your life that he's God and he can take you to the mat. The whole point of God's correction is to come to you and say, straighten up. Because we're not having a relationship right now because you keep messing up. Straighten up. And if you and I go, whatever, God goes, straighten up. I told you, get off the top of the roof. Look at me. Get off the top of the roof. Look at me. Whoosh, boom. Then Chuck Brush looks at me and goes, how'd that go? I'm like, hey, it was slippery up there. That's why I told you, get off the roof. And so now, that didn't fix it for me. You know, how I lost my job with Chuck Brush. I don't think I've ever told this publicly. <laughs> I lost my job with Chuck Brush because he came to me and said, Bob, you're not listening to me. You think you know it all. And you're going to cost me money. It would be better for you to go find another job. I cannot believe I'm telling you I got fired. Because correction, dumb things didn't work. And so he looked at me and said, sorry. I can remember after about a couple of years went by, and I needed to redo the, the roof on, my, on the queen's house. When the, when, the, when the roof on that house was getting a little bit, well, I know how to roof. And so he kind of let me go. I went to him about five years later, and I said, hey, Brother Brush, my, my in-law's house needs a roof. Can you come look at it and tell me what you think? We were standing, we were standing, and we're looking at this roof, and he goes, well, just replace it. And I said, well, when you lose your job, it's not like you can do it. He goes, no, 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 no. 
you know how to roof. You just were acting irresponsibly. I'm a roofer. <laughs> so I went and got my tool belt out of the, out of the little, little side thing there at the house and I put my toolbox, tool thing on, Bob the Builder, and let me tell you something, I, I got the shingles, I got the roll paper, I got the, the, the decking, I got the drip edge, I laid the first thing upside down, and I put that roof on, and I stood back and went, I sure hope it doesn't rain. <laughs> when God corrects, he does not correct with annihilation in mind. He corrects with, we can just get back to Jeremiah chapter 2, people. And after 70 years, we get to come back to this place right here. And we get to be friends again. And we get to have love again. And you come after me and I come after you. And this is going to be wonderful. But what we don't want is the correction. And I will tell you two things. One, if you are his child and you're playing games with him, he will correct you. And he will send you to captivity, but not to hurt you so that you can quickly get back to where you need to be. But if you're lost, oh, if you're lost, listen to this. I have just read you that the wrath of God is stored up. And if God can destroy the earth with water and God can destroy at the end with fire and God God can snuff stuff out and God, you know, say, don't fool with God and don't fool with your salvation because if you die without Christ or he returns after you've been given this opportunity to get saved, then you will be the recipient of his wrath. But as a child, God never corrects me except with one thought. Can we just get back to loving each other? And if you're going to act this way, let me step in and correct so that we can love each other. Thank you for taking the time to watch one of our services here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I would love to be a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. And if you need anything, I would love to be of help any way I can. Again, thanks for watching. I hope the sermon was a blessing to you and we will see you next time.